Welcome to this series on Scrum Master Preparation. Scrum is a very widely recognized agile development process. This nugget is going to introduce you not only to Scrum, but introduce you to the specifics of Scrum Master Certification or the process to follow to become a Scrum Master. In this introductory series, we're going to cover the very high level of what Scrum and Scrum Mastering is all about. We'll give you an overview of the Scrum process. We'll describe the Scrum roles, of which the Scrum Master is one, but there are other key roles involved with Scrum project work. We'll talk about a key principle of Scrum development, which is we develop in releases, and within the releases we develop in individual sprints, where a sprint has a very defined time box. Then we'll talk about some of the Scrum rituals. You're going to you're going to hear or you've probably heard terms such as the daily scrum, the sprint review process, the retrospective, and so on. So we'll orient you to the various scrum rituals or processes to be followed in a scrum development project. And we'll talk a little bit about scrum management. There is management process in scrum. And again, there's probably a few terms that you've heard of, such as the daily burn down chart, the story burn up chart, and so on, that will give you an overview of what Scrum management is all about, because there is a management process in Scrum. And finally, we'll talk about or differentiate the differences between Scrum and other agile development processes. But first, let's roll up our sleeves and focus on what is Scrum. So probably the very hardest thing I have to do in this Nugget series is to give you a definitive definition of Scrum. What is Scrum? Is Scrum a systems development approach? Yes. Is Scrum exclusive for systems development? Absolutely not. Anything, and I even hesitate to use the word thing, but anything you want to do that requires a level of work typically of a unique variety, because Scrum is not truly designed for routine day-to-day -day production, doing the same thing, manufacturing widgets day in, day out. That's not Scrum. So I would start to say Scrum is based on project-based work, where a project is a unique undertaking to develop, to deliver, to produce something new and unique. Does it have to be software? No. Typically when we discuss Scrum and most of the approaches we're going to discuss in this Nugget series are based on software development undertakings. And I really struggle with using the word project because most Agilist and most Scrum specialists try to differentiate between what we do with Scrum approaches and traditional project approaches. And that is very, very true. Scrum is very different than traditional approaches. And we'll discuss that in a future nugget. But I will continue to largely call out the work we're doing within Scrum as project-based work simply because it's unique and it has a goal. So when I refer to projects, I'm talking about something, some piece of work, something that we're going to do that is unique and has a goal and requires work. So again, I, I have found I use the word project most comfortably. As I say, there are other scrumists, agilists, who prefer to re re not use the word project only because the word project takes us into more the traditional mindset. But in the pure textbook definition, Scrum is project-based work, often associated with software, but not always. You can do anything in a Scrum world. So enough of the definition. What is Scrum? Scrum is very much iterative. 
If you're to tr find a single word, in my humble opinion, that defines what Scrum is, it's iterative. We do the project in pieces. And in a true sense of Scrum, we will do the project in many, many, many pieces. Each release that we discussed in the introduction, and we'll talk more in this nugget, is a part of the project. Within each release, we'll have a sprint or a number of sprints that make up a release. In the sprint, is developing a piece of the project. So that's why it's iterative. It's many, many, many pieces. And we'll talk about that aspect throughout this entire Nugget series. Another key differentiator of Scrum is it's very lightweight. You'll see by the time we finish this Nugget series, there is some very sound, some very complete, some very robust definitions of developing working in a scrum environment but there's not a lot there is not a lot of memorization there is not a lot of process there is not a lot of predefined forms as a matter of fact there are no predefined forms associated with scum scrum so it's very lightweight it's easy to learn scrum is very very easy to learn but it's also very hard to master I hope by the time we finish this Nugget series, you have absolutely done all of the learning and are even well on the way to mastering. As I've already said, it's very simple to understand. And it's based on these three principles. Transparent. There is nothing hidden. There's no traditional, now the team's going to go away for a period of time, two weeks, two months, etc., etc., and we're going to do some work and just trust us. There's none of that. Everything we do in a scrum environment is extremely transparent, and as we'll discuss in just a moment we, when we get into the roles, there's going to be a product owner. And the product owner represents the business. And the product owner is part of the Scrum team. And the product owner is expected to participate daily in the Scrum activities. So if you have your product owner, if you have the business sitting with the team for a significant part of every day, there is no, no ability to be non-transparent so Scrum is designed to be extremely transparent. We want that product owner. We want them involved. We want the feedback and we want to adopt and adjust, which is the flexible and adaptable. And quality is built in. A lot of people, when they look at a Scrum process or they first hear of Scrum process and says, yep, that's just the wild, wild west. We just have a bunch of rogue programmers out there writing code as they see fit and calling it Scrum. It's absolutely not the case. Quality is built in throughout Scrum. Each one of our iterations, each one of our sprints and each one of our releases has the expectation that we're delivering functional tested, implementable, code. Or if you're interested in using Scrum for a non-development approach, each sprint results in meaningful results that the business can choose to use at the end of each sprint. So transparent, nothing is hidden. We want full active participation. We build quality in. It's not the wild, wild west. It's tested, implementable code at every step of the process. And as we discuss some of the agile process that we're going to apply, continuous build, continuous integration, test-driven development. What we deliver in a Scrum environment is quality, and it's flexible and adaptable. Because our sprints 
are short. If we find we made some mistakes, if we find our approach is not correct, if we find we need to fix things, at the end of each print, we have a retrospective, and in the retrospective, we have the ability to be flexible and adaptable to improve, continuous process improvement. So with this relatively brief introduction to Scrum, I hope I've whetted your appetite on Scrum and that you're ready to continue through this introductory nugget and certainly through this entire series to better understand Scrum and to be better prepared to take your Scrum Master Certification. So consistent with the fact that Scrum is lightweight and easy to understand, there are five main roles defined in a Scrum process. The key role is the Scrum Master. And I hesitated to say the key role is because most people will suggest the product owner is the key role in a Scrum project. For the sake of this Nugget series, I'm saying the key role is the Scrum Master because that's why we're developing, that's why we're taking this series, is to understand what Scrum Mastering is all about and to prepare you to become a certified Scrum Master. The Scrum Master is not a project manager. The Scrum Master is a guide. The Scrum Master is a facilitator. The Scrum Master may be a participating team member. The Scrum Master has no authority. But a lot of influence. I still believe the Scrum Master is key to the success of Scrum processes because without an effective Scrum Manager filling these roles of the guide, the facilitator, able to work in a non-authoritative manner but to influence the team and guide the team to success Again, I believe the Scrum Master is certainly a key member of the Scrum development team, if not the key. As I say, a lot of other proponents of Scrum will say the product owner is the key role because the product owner is the person with the authority. On what is done. And that's where the product owner's authority stops. The product owner defines what it is the team is going to develop. The product owner creates things called user stories. The product owner provides the details around what a user story is. And we'll talk much more about a user story later in the series. But the user story basically, again, identifies the what and the product owner identifies the priority in which the what's are going to be done. And the product owner provides all of the details that the team needs to, to complete the what's. The team has the authority on how they accomplish the what. So the team is the people who work as a self-organizing, self-managing, self-controlled unit. There is no project manager in Scrum. There is a self-organizing, self-managing team that collectively determine how they're going to complete all of the work that the product owner has identified that needs to be done. The Scrum Master guides, facilitates, and influences the team, influence the businesses. And to me, one of the key roles of the Scrum Master is removes the roadblocks to allow the team to get the work done. And these three are really the core team. And they're all participating team members. As I said, we have transparency. The product owner is part of the team. The team does the work and the Scrum Master 
ensures the team works in a scrum-like method, and that is literally the core team. We have two other roles identified, SMEs, subject matter experts. Subject matter experts are not part of the team. Subject matter experts are called in as needed. In a utopia world, we would not need any SMEs because the product owner is all knowing, all seeing, all wise. In most real live business environments, a single person, the product owner, is not all knowing, all seeing, all wise. So therefore, there will be instances where the product owner says, you know, I really don't know that answer. Why don't you call Susan? And Susan becomes the SME. And then finally, we have another key person, and that's the business owner. That's the person with the dollars. That's the person with the need. And the product owner and the business owner may be one person, but often not. The business owner is typically a manager who has the power and the authority to commit organizational resources, i.e. dollars, to the project. And managers don't have the time to sit with the team for hours every day to work on the Scrum approaches. So the business owner appoints a product owner who does the day-to-day -day interaction with the team. The product owner typically organizationally reports to the business owner and typically the product owner reports to the business owner from a project results viewpoint as well. And that's it. Those are all of the roles associated with Scrum. Now, we have an entire nugget that's going to go through the roles and responsibilities of these team members in much more detail. But at an introductory level, these are our Scrum roles. And if you'll excuse my drawing, I know I'm not the most artistically talented in the world. This diagram to me represents the concept of releases and sprints. Overall, this black area, and I deliberately did not draw it as a square or a regular object because projects are typically not that well defined. There's typically a lot of changes, flexibility, well, we're not going to do this little piece here because that's better done outside the project. And there's a significant amount of work here that's, that's again, business process, manual activities, as opposed to everything inside the, the black object is the product that our Scrum team is going to develop. And the, developing this product may take a considerable amount of time. It may take 6 to 12 months to do all of the work associated with developing that product. Taking on 6 to 12 months delivery as a single delivery is a traditional development project. And we know Scrum is not a traditional development project because it's iterative with multiple releases and multiple sprints. So the business owner and the product owner work together to develop a release strategy. And they say, this can be release number one, and this can be release number two, and release number three, and so on. So if we deliver this functionality here, there's business value. Let's call that a release. And then we augment that with some more business value here. Let's make that a release. So a release may be one to two months in length. And that, again, is far too much time frame for a traditional Scrum approach. So then we take each release and we break it into a number of sprints. So this is sprint number one, sprint number two, three, and so on. And the sprints are in very short time frames where I am hesitating to tell you a defined number for a the length of a scrum sprint because there is some flexibility. But typically a scrum sprint is somewhere in the one to four week range where again, typically a lot of projects don't work at the extreme. So there's not a lot of sprints that are a week long or not a lot of scrum development approaches that take only one week sprints. 
nor are there a lot that take as much as four weeks because we lose some of the adaptability and flexibility, so most sprints are in the two to three week window. And in each one of these sprints, we deliver a little piece of the overall product. And when we combine sprints together, we get a release. And the release gives significant business value. And when we build all of the releases, we get the entire product. Now, a key concept of releases and sprints and scrum approaches in general is when the business owner and the product owner did the original plan, this is what they thought the product was going to look like, but part way into it, the product vision is going to change and we start to build that piece out there and we start to take this piece out and we build it and we reduce functionality and so on. And in a traditional approach, this is all done through change management and formal approval and formal authorization and work to do all of that. None of that happens in Sprint because all of this change is outside of our current sprint. So if the business wants to add more functionality, we'll get to it. When's that scheduled? Oh, that's gonna be in release number six. Great. The business decided to remove functionality and that was gonna be done in release number five. Awesome. So now release number five can do this piece over here. Oops, five, not two. So this is, again, part of the adaptability and flexibility of using Scrum processes is it lets the business adjust and flex and deliver exactly what it is the business needs as business change happens and as the business requirements evolve. And consistent with being lightweight, there are very few Scrum rituals we need to concern ourselves with. There are four main Scrum rituals, and I presented these a little out of order. I presented the daily Scrum first because my expectation is that's the first ritual you probably have heard of. That's the thing people think of most when they think of Scrum development, and that's the daily Scrum. And this is your 15-minute stand-up meeting where the team meets on a daily basis hence the term daily, for no more than 15 minutes. And in order to try to keep it to 15 minutes, we recommend that this be a stand-up meeting. If you're standing up and getting tired on your feet, you're not gonna be as prone to talk, as opposed to if you're sitting in comfy chairs with lots of uh, sweets sitting on the table and some nice fresh coffee at the back, your 15 minute stand up meeting quickly extends to an hour and a half because people just simply want to enjoy the soft chairs and the donuts and the fresh coffee. So idea of the daily scrum, 15 minutes max, stand up, get it done. And is what did we do? We do yesterday. What are we gonna do to do today and issues problems. Quick round the table, talk to every team member. Awesome. We know what's going on. Joe, can you work with Betty to help Betty accomplish what she's going to do? Fred, how did this go yesterday? Did that approach work? Awesome. Why don't we try that going forward and so on and so on. It's a perpetual process improvement to ensure the team is on track to achieve the objectives of the sprint. The first ritual that we do in Scrum, so again, literally it should have happened up there, is the planning meeting. And the planning meeting actually is where the business requirements are presented, where the product owner selects the stories that are next most important to the business. Story 15, story 36, story 49, and story two are the next most important stories, pieces of business functionality that I want the team to focus on over the next sprint. So part one of the planning meeting is we select the stories. And when I say we select the stories, the product owner selects the stories based on priority. And then in the second half of the planning meeting, the team 
validates that they can accomplish the story selected, that there's enough information at hand, that they understand the stories well enough to do the work, that there's enough time, that the environment is prepared, etc., etc. So with the planning meeting done, we then start the sprint two to three weeks on average. And we have a daily scrum for every day of those two to three weeks where we ensure that we're still on track for our approach that we've delivered for the sprint. At the end of the sprint, we do a scrum review where we present the results. So business product owner, you asked us to do these stories. We're going to have a little show and tell. We're going to show you the results. We're going to prove to you that we achieved everything you asked us to do. Is it acceptance test? Kind of. Presenting the results should be short and sweet. This should not take a lot of time. We do not expect formal PowerPoint presentations. It's literally a roll up the sleeves and present the results. Get confirmation that you have achieved the results, the expectation of the sprint, and declare the sprint done. And then finally, have a quick retrospective to say what worked, what didn't work, and start the process improvement. And the last key aspect to Scrum work is there is Scrum management. Like everything else in Scrum, it's very lightweight. There aren't project management plans, there aren't formal Gantt schedules, there aren't most of the things we typically associate with project management, but there is scrum management at a very lightweight. And probably one of the main scrum management tools is the burn down chart. How well are we doing? Here is a graph for the sprint, day one, day two, through day 10 or day 15, depending on whether we're a two or three week sprint. Here's our objective. We wanted to do 14 stories at the end of day one, how many stories at the end of day two, and so on. And we had a little lull in there. We had some complex stories. And we're tracking our progress to see if we accomplished the expectations of the Scrum. Talked about stories already. The story cards is where the product owner defines the what's. We don't do a large analysis document. We do a number of story cards. And most people recommend story cards are handwritten. So hopefully your handwriting is better than mine on index cards. And these index cards are used with uh, thumbtacks and maintained on a pegboard or a corkboard. But the story cards are part of the management where we identify the what's that's going to be required. And we combine these story cards on that corkboard to give us the product release backlog. So here are all of the story cards that are required to satisfy all of the what's. The product owner goes to the product backlog as part of sprint planning and selects the next higher urgency prioritized stories and presents them to the team. We use that to develop the sprint backlog. The sprint backlog is obviously the, the input to the burn down chart and it identifies the 14 stories that we want to accomplish in this sprint. And the final aspect that we haven't discussed yet in this nugget as part of Scrum Management is this principle of velocity. How long does or is a story? How much work is required to complete the story? And how much work can the team do in a sprint? So with this concept of velocity, we're able to take that sprint backlog, validate that we have the ability to complete all of the stories that the business has selected, 
and we can use our velocity to track how well to ensure the predictability of our burn down chart is allowing us to achieve our expectations of completing the sprint in 10 days. And in a nutshell, that's it for Scrum. Scrum is all about developing a, an agile approach to software development, which leads us to our next discussion point. What is the difference between Scrum and Agile? So where does Agile fit in? Well, my first statement is Scrum is Agile. Agile to me is a lightweight software development process. Scrum is a lightweight software development process. The big distinction I make between Scrum and Scrum is very focused on the management. And I will definitely put that in quotation marks. And I tried to write it in as small of letters as possible and still allow you to read my horrible handwriting because Scrum is a management light as we've experienced, but Scrum is the management process. It's identifying of the roles. It's identifying of the, the, the uh, rituals that we're going to go through. It's identifying of the artifacts we're going to produce. So Scrum is a way to develop lightweight software. And Scrum applies at your project discretion most of the agile development processes for software development, such as test driven development. Write the test cases, then write the code to ensure the test cases are successful, ensures we're delivering quality. Where appropriate, Scrum supports pair programming. Scrum absolutely expects that we're going to do refactoring that we are going to have technology debt, that we are going to have to do process improvement, that as we add new functionality in future sprints or future releases, that we're going to break things and we need to do improvement. So we're going to have refactoring. Recognizing that technology debt is inevitable in a, a lightweight, incremental, iterative software development process, Scrum recognizes that technology debt exists and must be removed through future sprints and future releases and absolutely supports the concept of continuous integration. You complete a piece of code, you check it into the repository, you run the build and you make sure you didn't break anything. So the distinction between Scrum and Agile is Scrum is one of the Agile processes. Scrum I believe is one of the most popular and most successful agile processes because Scrum has this very small letter quotation marks management process and when we apply our Scrum processes and other proven agile development techniques I believe we have an absolute recipe for success. So in this introductory nugget to the Scrum master preparation we provided a high level overview of Scrum. We defined what Scrum is. It's a lightweight iterative process with some very light management to help us develop traditional software, but any project in an iterative flexible manner. We discussed Scrum roles, the Scrum master, the product owner, and the team is the three core roles that participate in a Scrum project. We talked about releases and sprints combining to deliver the specific requirements of the business. We identified a number of Scrum rituals where the daily Scrum, the planning meeting, the Scrum review, and the Scrum retrospective allows us to keep the Scrum project under control 
consistent with Scrum management, where we provide a very lightweight management approach. And we conclude it with a review of Scrum is one adaptation, one method of being agile. So with this introductory nugget concluded, I hope you've remained interested in Scrum development, that you continue your interest in becoming a Scrum master, and I encourage you to continue through the rest of this nugget series and further explore and further understand this exciting world of becoming a Scrum master. This concludes our nugget on Scrum Master Preparation. I hope this module has been informative for you, and thank you very much for viewing.